They talk about our bodies, they talk about our weight, they talk about you know what kind of makeup we should or shouldn't be wearing. We experience it on playgrounds, we experience it on workplaces, we experience it on our social media feeds. This isn't only something that happens to conservative or liberal women. It's not something that only happens to white women. It happens to all women who are in public life. We look forward this evening to introduce the Violence Against Women Act, of which I'm the lead sponsor with over 150 co-sponsors. Kamala Harris made history on multiple fronts during the 2020 election cycle as a second in line for the most powerful office in the country. Women and women of color shattered the glass ceiling with a record number serving in Congress, but their intersectional identities made them more likely to be targeted for online abuse based on their race and gender. Research shows that women around the world are subjected to physical, sexual, economic, and psychological violence for choosing to participate in politics. A recent study by the Wilson Center looked at online harassment targeting Vice President Kamala Harris, Representative Elise Stefanik, Representative Ilan Omar, and a number of other high-profile women across the political divide during the two months leading up to the 2020 elections. The study revealed more than 336,000 pieces of gendered or sexualized abuse. Over 78% of what we found was targeted at now Vice President Kamala Harris during the election campaign. So many people uh, can't understand how a woman of color would reach such heights without some sort of either duplicitous or uh, sexualized behavior in her past. Women of color are subjected to compounded abuse, whether it's just name calling that is based on gender or sex, uh, or whether it's these really deep-seated false narratives. Like this one. Omar, who came in here, married her brother or something, and came in illegally. Omar said the claims, in addition to being untrue, were absurd and offensive. Online abuse can spill over into physical threats to women's safety offline. Earlier today, Attorney General Dana Nessel was joined by officials from the Department of Justice and the FBI to announce state and federal charges against 13 members of two militia groups who are preparing to kidnap and possibly kill me. The authors of the study say this kind of disinformation and abuse is a threat to democracy. Although men are also victims of online attacks, women are more likely to face sexualized abuse. The downstream effects on women's participation in democracy, on their participation in the public discourse are pretty clear. When we see women at the highest levels of government enduring gendered and sexualized abuse, they're going to think twice about whether they want to participate in the public discourse. This sort of abuse is meant to keep women out of public life, period. I'm Katie Hill and I'm running for Congress, but this is not who I am. I'm not a career politician. Katie Hill's abrupt resignation from Congress is an example of the role online harassment can play in altering a woman's political career. Hill became one of the highest profile freshmen in Congress after the 2020 midterm, when she was elected to represent California's 25th congressional district and flipped a Republican seat. But less than a year after taking office, Hill resigned amid publication of nude photos of her and allegations that she had romantic relationships with congressional and campaign subordinates. I'm leaving because of a misogynistic culture that gleefully consumed my naked pictures, capitalized on my sexuality, and enabled my abusive ex to continue that abuse, this time with the entire country watching. I am leaving because of the thousands of vile, threatening emails, calls, and texts that made me fear for my life and the lives of the people that I care about. My voicemail was, you know, completely just full of nasty sexual um, you know, scary stuff. But the social media accounts were just bombarded with it. I've talked a lot since then about how I was suicidal and how I, um, the recovery from that point was, has been quite a journey. Critics have argued that social media companies have not done enough to curb online harassment. Facebook and Twitter officials say they continue to improve their monitoring system, but attackers still find ways to get around them. Our cases reported and reviewed. Our decisions made. What tools are used to enforce? Publishing answers to questions like these will make our process more robust and accountable to the people we serve. As social media platforms decided to crack down on some of the false narratives that were being spread, uh, people would then 
change them. We call this malign creativity. So to avoid detection, they would shift the visual meme a little bit or crop it a certain way. Or they would use different nicknames and different slogans to try to avoid detection. Andy Kim, a research engineer at Yahoo, recently worked on a machine learning project that would improve the site's ability to remove rampant hate speech and harassment. He broke down how some platforms identified online harassment. As an example, these comments were removed by keyword detection from LA Times videos. So the first level is actually, yeah, the keyword detection, and we want to make sure we're filtering some of these really terrible words hate speech and things like that. We also have users flagging certain content so that our own team can come in and look at some of these comments. But there are things that are definitely more nuanced that makes it really difficult to tackle. We have the next level. In this case, we break up each sentence into ones and zeros. And once we've done that, we can encode it and throw it into this neural network. It's like a black box. It takes in all the numbers and then says basically, yes, this is hate speech based off of what our users have annotated with that neural network. We need to have a lot of data. And with this data, we need to have users come in and annotate the data set. So they read a sentence and they say, yes, this is hate speech or no, this is not hate speech. But of course, this comes in with the biases of the people who are judging these sentences. So our machines can only be as good as the people who annotate some of this data. The authors of the Wilson study believe a collective effort by social media platforms, lawmakers, and employers is fundamental to addressing this problem and creating an equal opportunity to participate in democracy and public life. There's just this reality that we live in where corporations are going to do what benefits the corporation. They're not going to go as far as they would if we required them to. On the campaign trail, Biden said he would prioritize reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act, which he co-authored and helped pass in 1994. The law originally addressed sexual violence and domestic abuse. The new proposal included updates to address online harassment and cyber exploitation. On March 17, 2021, the House voted to pass the Violence Against Women Act. The yeas are 244. The nays are 172. The bill is passed. The reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act is a historic move, but it's still limited in addressing the overall issue. Women are just expected to uh, endure a much higher level of abuse and vitriol than their male counterparts. And the systems that exist to protect users online, they're built for and by white cisgender men. And so uh, when, we, when we look at the reporting structures, they just really do not support women. And so those, even though those seem like little changes that won't undo millennia of, of misogyny, um, they can change behaviors little by little in the short term and create a more equitable, democratic, safe environment for women online. <laughs>